Uh, good morning. I want to thank uh, the organizers and Stephen for uh, inviting me here. And I want to try first thing off the bat uh, uh, to earn my honorarium by referring to a question which I think Stephen thinks central to this uh, meeting, which is this distinction between uh, between mere, merely doing like things, doing things like neurons firing away and feeling. And I've been I've been tracking. I've, I've been away. I only arrived yesterday, so I, I missed. Uh, a lot of the excitement, unfortunately, I was at another conference, but I, I tracked things on Facebook and I saw there was, there was some li lively exchange to that effect. And every time someone claimed that, uh, look, this doing actually is feeling, Stephen would say, no, it isn't. So instead of us going back and forth, you know, it is, isn't, is, is not, uh, I, I would uh, open with a few slides that would just kind of set, of, set, set some kind of methodological framework for resolving this question. I don't promise to actually resolve it. I want to, to air some methodological principles which could help us resolve it. So the first observation is, uh, this is uh, from an old Scientific American paper by the Churchland, by, by Paul and Patricia Churchland, uh, their so-called luminous room example, which of course is a take on John Searle's Chinese room. So this is in response to people who say, look, uh, this is a Victorian kind of dressed gentleman back in 1890s, just after Clark Maxwell published his theory of electromagnetism, which explains the nature of light. So this gentleman picks up a magnet and starts waving it in a room which is otherwise dark, and nothing happens, no light happens. So he says, it cannot be that if you just you know, have some dynamics of a magnet that light would ensue. And of course, you see the fallacy in this argument, and that was the point of the Churchland's uh, uh, idea of airing it. And so the, I, I call this... Uh, kind of tentatively the serial Harnad argument against reductive explanations as applied in this case to Maxwell's theory. And it goes, oscillation of the magnet cannot amount to lighting, it's merely doing. Another example, uh, so that was the luminous room invented by the Churchlands, and here's the, what I call the, the Pina Bausch Memorial Dance Room. I'm sorry, I have to cut this off. I would rather listen to it. So someone would say, someone would say, maybe even people present in this room would say, this is not dancing, this is people moving. I think the doing, uh, I, I, this, it's kind of cut off on the left here. The doing slash feeling distinction is without merit, just as the movement slash dance is without merit. And so I think that to evaluate a theory that purports to explain feeling in terms of some type of doing, we need merely to do what scientists do every day. We need to subject it to some standard scrutiny. And this is what this scrutiny could amount to on a very high level. This is, as you notice, this talk is on a much higher level conceptually than the previous one. So I'm sorry for the abrupt change, but that, that's the way I work. Uh, so here's the world as normal people see it. Here's the world the scientists see it. And what, is there a contradiction or is there a disconnection? I think there's neither a contradiction nor a disconnection. So light just is whatever electrons do when they wiggle around. And uh, in that respect, of course, we can observe methodologically that science combines, scientific explanations combine downward reduction. We explain things in terms of things that compose them in particular ways. That might be jumps. Uh, in, there definitely would be jumps in the level of explanation. And so to account for those jumps, we have to make room for the so-called emergence, the upward emergence. And in one of those Facebook exchanges, Stephen objected that uh, you can explain everything away by emergence. Well, no, there are constraints on those processes, and I'm, I'm sure uh, we, we are aware of them, but it's still worth reminding ourselves of what those are. So if the value of a theory, such as the explanation of light in terms of some wiggling of electrons, is judged by its predictiveness, its explanatory power, and very importantly, how well it meshes with other theories. This is very important, so I want to quote Willard Quine, 1953. This is from The Two Dogmas of Empiricism. Total science is like a field of force whose boundary conditions are experience. A conflict with experience at the periphery occasions readjustments in the interior of the field. So we have a whole bunch, a pile, actually too much, an embarrassment of riches in terms of findings. And, and how do we make sense of them? 
specifically if we have a particular explanation of a very tough phenomenon to explain, such as feelings or phenomenal experience. Well, we don't have any option but go by this route, I think. And we go by this route, we see if an explanation which is offered uh, withstands those tests. If, if, if this fabric of explanation, the, the previous the sentence, one before this one in, in Quine's essay, involves a similar metaphor, um, a, a, a fabric, which as long as it doesn't appear, um, withstands the addition of, uh, the adduction of facts into the process of explanation, if everything is fine, well, we moved a bit closer to explaining things. Even the things that need to be explained seem intuitively to be very, very um, resistant to explanation. So, again, very briefly, this I'm, I'm still trying to get to my actual presentation, but uh, I, I felt obliged, given the, the topic of the, the theme of the conference, to say something about why have any phenomenal experience at all? Why not just be uh, zombies? So I invoke this picture, uh, which really doesn't do justice to the scene which it depicts. It's one of my favorite locations in the state of Utah um, in the uh, Capitol Reef National Park there. If you're interested, I can direct you there. The upper Muley Twist Canyon. And when I'm there, I'm struck by the visual appearance of the red rock, which this picture doesn't do justice to. This is my tent, by the way, here. And, and so what, what does this visual experience amount to? How can I explain it in terms that would intuitively be satisfactory. Well, I have to work by the standard methodology. I have to pump your intuition so you agree that the, 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 the things that I offer in the way of explanation together, as they hang together, uh, do the trick. So uh, here's a very short version of this. Phenomenality amounts to perceiving this state of affairs of the universe and me being there looking at that scene as simultaneously distinct from others. This is discernment. No discernment, no phenomenality. You cannot have just one qualia, by the way. You can have, if you have many qualia, that's when your phenomenal experience is rich, and then you perceive one as distinct, this scene as distinct from many possible others. So I didn't have space on this line to include this. Simultaneous, simultaneously distinct from many, many others. The more, the richer, I'll, I'll be getting there in a bit uh, uh, of time, a bit more formally, simultaneously distinct from many others and many other states. And then plus, an additional component to this is caring about its affordances and relationships to other stuff. So this is discernment plus value, and thereby we get uh, evolutionary advantage over zombies, which uh, I don't even say who do, who do not feel because they are not who, they are which, which do not feel because they don't care by default. So by the way, if you, if you think that value or, or caring is some kind of a mystical uh, mind stuff. Well, no, it's not mystical. If you have perception and action space, so some d dimensions for perception and action, just throw an additional bunch of dimensions for caring, and so this landscape kind of morphs. And what does it mean? It means that those dimensions of perception plus action kind of feel, uh, feed into themselves, and the dynamics of things are such that uh, uh, the system tends to go in certain directions, given some perceptions go, going, going to in, 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 towards certain actions as opposed to others. This is all that, that caring is about. This is what value boils down to. So now getting to the actual um, talk, finally, there are different levels of analysis, uh, as Mar famously pointed out, for information processing tasks, of which I think phenomenal experience is just one example. So the task level, uh, it's great out here because I'm, I'm not going to talk about it any more than I already did. Uh, evolutionary angle, I think it's evolution that, that uh, ensures that discernment plus value equals advantage over zombies. But what I want to focus on is the computational theory level, which basically boils down to, I think, discernment capacity as quantified by VC dimension, Dapnik, Chervo, Nenki's dimension. I'll get to there in a, in a few seconds. Algorithmic level, I'm not going to treat again. This is why it's grayed out here. Not even read that bullet point. And then I think importantly, this is surprisingly important, or maybe not surprisingly, the implementation level. People often don't care about the thing. Oh, it's merely implementation. Let me just figure out what, uh, what the algorithms are, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll gain an understanding of what's going on. I think in this case, implementation is important. So here in a nutshell, what again, I'll, I'll expand on a bit later, discernment must be intrinsic. 
I, I will dwell on this concept again and again. It must arise from within the system's own temporal dynamics, which endows the system's trajectory space with some non-trivial topological structure. For example, uh, multi-scale homology. Again, I'll, I'll explain what that means. And so when you take those different levels of explanation together, that, that puts in place at least uh, uh, the, the, the basis for that fabric of explanation for the really very big thing that we are trying to explain. So uh, I want to start my, my domain of study used to be vision exclusively for many years. I want to study uh, vision, and I want to start with a quote from Wittgenstein because I think a distinction he made with regard to vision is very important. I don't agree with his views necessarily on the nature of phenomenal perception, but I think this, this quip that we, we find certain things about seeing puzzling because we do not find the whole business of seeing puzzling enough, I think it's, it goes straight to the point. So, levels of seeing. Seeing has different levels. And you think, uh, you know, we are, I, I am the, the epitome of, of a system that can see. And here's another human being that also um, epitomizes seeing. But notice it's not at the top of the page here because I reserved the top of the page for the sheep because sheep actually have as a part of uh, the structure of the retina and, of course, the corresponding structures in the brain, uh, not just one high-resolution region like our fovea, but two. So they, they can look out. They do look out with high resolution, both straight ahead and to the sides, kind of in, in, a, in a streak surrounding them so that they can graze properly, but also look out for uh, sheepdogs or whatever may chase them around. So in that respect, the visual experience of a sheep is actually richer than the visual experience of mm, the late Marty Feldman. Um, what about this? This is another favorite example of mine. This is a small portion of the rim of a scallop. Scallops have different species have 10, 20, 50 eyes. This scallop is blue-eyed. You see two of the 50 eyes that it possesses, cilia with which it sifts food. So um, we know that we see. We know that sheep see by extension. We know that scallops, you cannot call a scallop blind because uh, when a, a cuttlefish swims over it, it, it would shut its shell close and it would escape. So it sees. It's not like it doesn't see. But then we tend to draw a line here. This is actually my favorite camera. I have one instance of that right in my pack over. This is D60 by Nikon, an old camera. Does a camera see? We kind of tend to think, no, cameras don't see. Uh, your phone doesn't see. You will see when you look at what your phone uh, uh, shot just now. But then Look, we have to make allowance for the inexorable progress of technology. So these days you have cameras, not my camera, but you have cameras that can do face recognition. They can focus on the face. How can you say that the camera is blind when it actually focuses on the face? So it sees to some extent on some level, different level maybe from, from the scallop even. Uh, well, maybe not because it focuses. So, so I want now to zero in on this distinction. Uh, this is what Wittgenstein called seeing something as something. So a camera definitely can see something as a face. It's a very impoverished quality, but it can see something as a face because it acts appropriately. How can you deny, how can you deny it that, that uh, quality? So and I want to make a distinction now to something which, which uh, Wittgenstein called just seeing. So seeing as as opposed to just seeing. He called it seeing without just. But I want to make this distinction even more, even more poignant. So, Here's another picture from my hikes out in the west. This is near Death Valley. It's the wall of a very boring canyon, not this red rock, nice red rock, just some conglomerate rock, very boring. But you know, I look here, and uh, it's a bunch of uh, gravel, packed gravel. It's visually very rich, but categorically, it's kind of not very rich. So the distinction between just seeing and seeing as is exactly the distinction between the, you could say, boring maybe even, richness of this texture and stuff. I mean, we see it as highly textured as opposed to, say, this uh, 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 area on the screen. Uh, and, and, and seeing some cat something categorical there. So some of you may, may already have zeroed in on, on a categorical percept in this picture. I definitely have, uh, when I looked at this for a second or two, this protruding rock looked to me like the face of uh, Tulsa Doom uh, played by James Earl Jones in Conan the Barbarian. Actually, there's a morphing there uh, between uh, a serpent, sorry, actually, his own face and the serpent face. So 
when you see this, and I, I can now, I cannot now see the, unsee what I what I perceive this as. I just see this as a serpent face. But but when you do that, you fall into kind of a, you're funneled into very impoverished perceptual phenomenal state, as opposed to the broad and rich perceptual phenomenal state which precedes it. So in a sense, kind of. Paradoxically, as I'll point out very soon, uh, just seeing, which is not categorical, it's the opposite of, sorry, David, it's the opposite of categorical. It's actually richer, and I think it's, it's more of a puzzle, but then we can resolve the puzzle. And we'll go very quickly now, because I think I'll pick up speed, because I want really to, to squeeze too much in, into, into the time I have. So uh, here is how, you, how I uh, interpret the distinction between uh, seeing as and just seeing in terms of learning theory. So in learning theory, you can think, well, learning theory is applied to visual perception uh, or any kind of perception. You have a measurement front end, and then you have a categorization back end, uh, which uh, takes the description, the, the snapshot, the measurement of the world as it is just now, and categorizes it. And, and I don't have to define categorization thanks to the preceding talk. But in computational terms, we may think, um, of a formalization of this. So the back end, the categorization back end, you can think of it as uh, 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 constituting a class of concepts, could be binary, yes, no, serpent head, not serpent head, red or everything else, um, defined over a class of inputs, which are measurements performed by this front end, so that every member concept implements a mapping from that space of inputs to zero or one, zero, bi binary, categorical, um, output. So the so-called vapnik chervonenkis dimension uh, quantifies the ability of this categorization back end to discern among potentially different inputs. So um, the definition of this quantity is uh, the cardinality of the largest set of inputs that a member concept can shatter. So how, how, many, how many possible stimuli are there in the largest set that my categorization system can make sense of in terms of my concepts. This sounds a bit abstract, so let me, actually it is pretty abstract. So let me give you an example. So suppose your, your um, uh, set of categories are straight lines. How does a straight line categorize points in a plane? Points can be either on one side of the line or on the other side of the line. So what is the largest set of points in a plane that the category straight line can shatter, can, can um, split apart any whichever way. How about three points? You can see in this illustration that by, by drawing a straight line, you can shatter a set of three points any whichever way. There are eight ways of, of making two categories out of three points in a plane. All of them are drawn here, and the category is denoted by uh, the color of the circle, uh, full or, or, or open. You can see that for three points, the class or the category of straight lines works. It shatters. It, it, it can support any whichever way distinction. What about four points? Well, because I'm asking this question, you, you might guess, no, for four points, the set of straight lines, the class of straight lines will not do. Indeed, it will not, because if you have four points of which you want those to, to belong to one category and those two to the other, you're screwed. You need something more complex than a straight line, than a set of straight lines. For example, a parabola would do, which is not a surprise. You throw in an additional parameter, you get more power with regard to categorization. So this is then the key observation. Among several conceptual systems that share the same measurement space, the same front end, the one with the highest VC dimension is the most capable of distinguishing various subtle aspects of a given input. So seeing it as this or as that. And so in other, in other words, the more complex or higher VC dimension a visual system is, the richer and more detailed is its perception of a given scene. So paradoxically, this is exactly what corresponds to a larger capacity for just seeing. Because I have, if, I, if, I, if my VC dimension is higher, I'm complex, I con contain multitudes, I can parse the visual input or the auditory input or, or the olfactory input or the world any whichever way. So 
paradoxically, why I say paradoxically? Because, because it would seem that, that um, categorization is sophisticated and just seeing is not, but actually it's the other way around. If you, only if, not just if, only if you have multiple way of categorizing the same input that the front end provides you with, only then you can just see it. You can step back, refrain from categorization. You know, don't just uh, do something, stand there, to quote uh, from the Disney version of, of Alice in Wonderland. Okay, so an example, a pedestrian avoidance system in a car, which some cars actually owned by some of the richer friends of mine already possess, uh, they, they, can, they can avoid pedestrians. They can see something as, as a pedestrian. Do they see beyond that? Of course not. The human driver, of course, you see the difference. Uh, it's important to realize that it comes with a very severe, very steep, very steep price. Not, not intractable, but a pretty steep price. The higher your VC dimension, the more data you need to train it. But that's a side remark. I, I, I'm not going to go on that tangent. So uh, what is left behind when you go, when you move from just seeing to, when, when you move from the expansive, the rich ability of just seeing to, to, to the small, impoverished ability merely to see it as this or as that with a small number of um, uh, uh, the, the, the possible outcomes. So this actually, if, if I were talking in Hebrew, this would be a nice pun because this is in Hebrew as. So seeing as is seeing a goat, which was pointed out to me in the middle of a talk I gave a couple months ago in Hebrew in, uh, in Israel. So when you just see this, even though, I mean, there are people, I kind of pity people who look out at the desert and say, oh, this is boring. There's tremendous richness in desert landscape, landscapes, even if they don't include a goat in them. You have this fine texture, you know, sagebrush, rocks, limestone, whatnot. And this is what, what is happening to you when you look there. As you are looking there, you are in tune with that, and you don't have to commit to particular interpretation. You look back, you look away, you, you, you remember there was a bush, there was another bush, there was a rock, and there was a goat. And that's, that's seeing things as, and that's, that's just seeing, okay? And you see the difference. And I want to, this is the last in, in, this, uh, in this part of my talk, the last example. I want to offer you this example of uh, what do you think it is? Hmm? Wasp? Wasp? Who, who said moth? Are you a biologist? Okay. Thank you. Look, people, wasps don't have these. Okay? This is a moth that, that camouflages as a wasp for obvious reasons. If I were a moth, I would probably do the same if I could. My point is, if you are if you are a specialized moth hunter, so you eat moths, ah, a dangerous proposition. Some of them are poisonous, actually, without you know posing as a wasp. But definitely, a moth that poses as a wasp would 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 throw you off the case, off its case, because if your visual system is specialized at, at seeing things as moths, you will not see it as a moth. But if you have, if you step back, if you are lucky to have evolved to have a, a richer perceptual system and also to be trained as a biologist, <laughs> then, uh, then you, can, you can step back from this, you can, you can perceive the richness. And then maybe uh, you can diversify your diet by figuring out, oh, it looks like superficially like a wasp, but actually you can eat it probably because it's, it's a mere moth. So you can see, I think this is a hint of an evolutionary advantage of just seeing as opposed to be very specialized like a pedestrian detection system, avoidance system, or, or, a, or a, a moth detection system. So that was the computational theory level. I want now to move to the implementation level. And I, I read this passage already about how discernment might, must be intrinsic, so let me now put some substance behind that claim. So any theory of phenomenal experience must be intrinsic. A system's experience of the world cannot be up to an outside observer. It sounds like a trivial observation, but it, it's not just often. It's pretty much always overlooked in theories of, not just of phenomenal experience, theories of representation. Of course, there, there are the kind of uh, 
diehard philosophers, you know, good for them, who say representation for the sake of whom? And well, people in cognition like me, I used to do the same trick, kind of walk around that and kind of don't pay attention to, to, the, to the need of, of uh, a specification of exactly in what sense this is representation for the rest of the system or for whatever. If, 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 if we're talking about representation, this is representation about, about something for the rest of the system, you cannot talk about this subsystem without mentioning the rest of the system. The same goes for, of course, we, we, we broaden the, the consideration here. The same goes, I actually believe, as, as you're finding out uh, right now, in a representational computational theory or explanation of phenomenality. The same goes for phenomenality. So phenomenal experience cannot be explained by appealing to entities or quantities that are not intrinsic to the system itself. And this is an idea which originated, um, I mean, I think I, I learned about it from my friend Tomer Fekete. Uh, I think this is a Minds and Machines paper in, in 09, and this is our co-authored paper from last year in uh, consciousness and cognition on which, from which most of the remaining material is drawn, so you're, you're welcome to, to uh, peruse that paper. So that's the first requirement. It's very, very important. The second requirement, no less important, because I'm committed to a computational explanation, uh, it has to be tractable. So if, if a transition between two experiential states is to be explained by a computation that, that the system performs on some set of variables, the brain must be capable of completing that computation within an appropriate time frame. Tractability is important. It's kind of, it sounds funny to me. I feel strange to, to push this idea, but because of course, you know, actually my, my PhD is in computer science. That's where I'm coming from. But maybe not, not a sufficient proportion of people in the field out there are aware of this uh, particular constraint. So uh, with, the, with those two constraints in mind, let's examine this popular notion uh, that an instantaneous brain state uh, can be used as a basis for a theory of representation or phenomenal experience. This is problematic because communication among neurons is not instantaneous. Uh, it's funny, I can, I can quote Einstein. Actually, in a recent publication, I did cite Einstein 1905, the special theory of relativity on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. It's wonderful for me to be able to, to, to cite Einstein. But look, it's relevant to the brain because relativistically speaking, relativistically, not relatively, relativistically speaking, it's an important consideration in the brain because the, the, the speed of propagation of signals in the brain is finite. And this neuron on this side of my, my brain doesn't instantaneously know what the neuron on the other side of my brain is up to. So, the instantaneous state of a network of neurons is a mathematical fiction. It's a very useful fiction, but it's a fiction which necessitates some kind of uh, zero lag outside observer and definitely does not exist intrinsically. So casting theories in terms of instantaneous states is also problematic because an instantaneous sna snapshot of neuron activities, you freeze time, you write down um, the activity of each neuron at that frozen instant of time, how does that constrain what the hell will happen to the system the next instant? I can just write down 10 billion numbers on 10 billion pieces of paper. Is that a phenomenal state? What will happen the next instant? Of course, there's a difference between a bunch of pieces of paper with numbers written on them and my neurons, and the difference is obvious. My neurons are dynamical, they exist in time, and they talk to each other, and they constrain what will happen to them in the next instant, given what's happening to them right now as I froze time. So uh, it used to be my favorite theory of how phenomenal perception works. Um, here's a quote from Jack Smart, who is one of, uh, I think, three fathers of the identity theory of mind, which was put, was put in place uh, about the time when I was born. Uh, the identity theory has three fathers and no mothers I know of. So Jack Smart, uh, Woolen Place, and, and Herbert Feigl, I think. And the idea is you take something that the brain does. Actually, in this passage, which I'll, I'll read in a sec, you, you, froze, you froze time, and then you claim this is it. This is the, 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 the basis of the identity theory. So walking in a forest, seeing the blue of the sky, the green of the trees, the red of the track, one may find it hard to believe that our qualia 
are merely points in a multidimensional similarity space. But perhaps that is what it is like to use a, a phrase that can be distrusted to be aware of a point in a multidimensional similarity space. This, this is very enticing, but it cannot be right. So I was wrong for many years but in, in, in taking this to be all of the needed explanation. I think it has the core of it in, in, insofar as it is an identity theory. It does the metaphysically right thing to draw an identity between the exponendum and whatever you use, you invoke to explain it. But it stops short of, of, of explaining everything that needs to be explained. So one particular problem here is the role of silent dimensions. I call it one-hand clapping. So right now, okay, multidimensional similarity space, one dimension per neuron. What about neurons that are not firing right now? I froze time out of my 10 billion neurons. Nine billions are silent. How do they participate? Are they even in? If, if you say they are in, but they are silent, what about your neurons? You know, Why draw a line here? There's no principled way of resolving that problem. So why, why one hand clapping? You know, Two neurons, one silence, like one neuron clapping. It's, it's a koan, which can be resolved, and we'll see the resolution very soon. Just let time roll. So being in time, this is the title, title of my presentation, actually. So with time, as the system's constituent units interact, its dynamics becomes apparent, most important to the system itself, so intrinsically. How does the system know which way to go in time the next instant? Well, the neurons are wired a particular way. Just let them go. Let them do whatever they do. So we propose, we, Tom or Faculty and myself, that the system's phenomenal experience inheres in its dynamics. This is a metaphysically, uh, I think, as I said, right thing to do. It's a dangerous thing to do. I'm sticking my neck out, and it will be stepped on, I'm sure, very soon. But still. So because signaling within any neuro network, network of neurons cannot be instantaneous, this implies that experience must be in inherently temporally extended. That's why the title, being in time. You cannot be but be in time. So some people who are actually in favor of the dynamical approach, the dynamical explanation, like my friend Rafi Malach, say, oh, it, it, it's, it's dynamical, but it actually boils down to, it boils down to the system settling into an attractor. I think this is definitely not going far enough. So uh, on his reading, phenomenal experience emerges when all relevant neurons in the network are informed about their own population state. This, is, this, do, this doesn't work. There's a computational result that, that, that proves, and this is, you know, this is computer science, which is a branch of, of mathematics. You do deduction there. It's not induction. It can be proved that this is not a tractable problem. So attaining agreement in asynchronous distributed system is computationally intractable. This is, is, no, this is known as, as the Byzantine agreement problem, Byzantine generals, not because it's, it's complex, not in that sense of Byzantine. Uh, you know, two generals want to coordinate. This is the old days, uh, no email, just, you know, pigeons. Uh, they want to coordinate an attack on the walled city, and so one sends a pigeon to the other one. Let's do it on, on the dawn of the day three days from now. And it ha he has to wait for the, for the, for the pigeon coming, coming back and, and confirming the, re the, the receipt of the first message because if each of them tries to attack separately, they will be severally vanquished. And of course, this goes back and forth because this, the, the intuition basically behind the proof that distributed, agree distributed asynchronous agreement is, is not tractable uh, in, in computational terms. So there is a, another problem with the attractor dynamics idea which is, uh, how should I introduce it? There is this conceptual fallacy. Let me introduce it by, uh, by reading the subtitle uh, to this edition of Donald Hebb's um, uh, uh, Organization of Behavior from 1949. This is an early 60s edition, which I have. I think um, it was, the, the subtitle was added by an editor. I don't think Hebb would have put something here like that. It says here, stimulus and response and what occurs in the brain in the interval between them. I think it's, it's a big fallacy to study. Uh, uh, well, it's not fall fallacy to study what happens in the way of response when you present a stimulus, but to, to pose, to, to, to pretend that that explains big time phenomena like consciousness and phenomenal experience, I think is misguided. Uh, Brain dynamics is more complex than a series of descents into unrelated attractors. We know, of course, and I will, I will just 
glance over the slide, we know that things are happening in the brain with, uh, even without the presentation of what a neuro, neuroscientist would call a stimulus, the, the, the background activity and so on. That's how phenomenality needs to be studied. In computational terms, there are tools, including in dynamical systems theory, for dealing with this kind of uh, happening or happenings. Uh, I'll just mention the name for this phenomenon, chaotic uh, itinerancy. Uh, this is due to, uh, well, it, it was not invented by Cesc van Leuven, but, uh, but he used that in the context of uh, some papers on phenomenality. So experience is ongoing dynamics. Uh, you might be tempted to imagine your mind as a kind of floating ball that moves around in the high-dimensional neural state space of the brain. What you have to be careful about, however, is conceiving of yourself as the equivalent of a little homunculus sitting on that ball going along for the ride. You're not a little homunculus. You're not even the ball. You're the trajectory. It's quoting from a good friend, Michael Spivey, who almost got it right. There's one extra uh, thing to, to uh, ingredient to throw in here to make an explanation more plausible. This trajectory space must be intrinsically holy. It cannot be, it, it, it cannot be solid in the, state that, in the sense that any trajectory within it would be equally feasible given the dynamics of the system because then a distinction between different regions, representational subspaces, would be up to an outside observer. So the holes must be intrinsic. So it cannot be, it cannot be Gruyere, okay? It has to be it has to be Emmental because in a Gruyere, all the trajectories, okay, you see what I mean, are equally feasible, so it cannot be like that. If you want a categorical an intrinsic categorical distinction between this trajectory and this one, the system's own dynamics must forbid the one that's in between, which is why I said Emmental just now, okay? Uh, in a dynamics fancifully represented by this piece of Emmental, there can be no trajectory going this way. Why? Because that's how it's wired up. You know, this neuron pushes that way, that one pulls this way, and so on. So we, we write about it this, in, in this paper here. So the system's dynamics riddles the space of possible trajectories with holes. It becomes capable of supporting intrinsic representational discernment. And there is a theory behind that, computational theory that, that can quantify how that can happen. It's called, uh, uh, let's see, persistent homology of the space of possible trajectories. Homology because it's about, because it's about, it's, it's, a, it's topology, it's not metric geometry. And persistent homology is because it's parameterized. So if, think of this big wheel that you turn, that if you turn it one way, there are more holes. If you turn it that way, there are fewer holes. The representational capacity of the system, which would be quantified by that computational means, would change as you turn that parameter. But specific qualitative um, regions in this space would persist. This is why it's called persistence homo persistent homology. Again, I'm totally skipping the, the computational details, but you can find them in the paper. So to sum up, because unfortunately I'm out of time. So experience, or the feel, emerges from the dynamics. Discernment reduces to the system's wanderings through a structured space of trajectories and the structure of the space is determined by the dynamics of the entire system, including silent units, because if counterfactually, if this neuron kept mum, that's why the trajectory went that way. So it has, counterfactually, it has a causal, it has had a causal effect on what the hell happened. So, uh, so what matters is my holiness. And actually, it's a two-way pun, because it has to be, it has to pertain to the whole system, which has to be kind of riddled with holes, if you, you have to pardon my puns. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the sound of one hand clapping, the sound of one neuron working. And um, I want, I want to, to leave you with a more somber view of this matter. I mean, this, this is not just a you know, kind of new age koan business. So a moment of appreciation for matter. This is a quote from one of the last books that William James wrote. James lost, I think, two children to childhood diseases. So he, he wrote in, in Pragmatism in 1907, matter is indeed infinitely, incredibly refined. To anyone who has ever looked on the face of a dead child or parent, the mere fact that matter could have taken for a time that precious form ought to make matter sacred ever after. 
that beloved incarnation was among matter's possibilities. Thanks for your time. Thank you.